Welcome, everybody. Um, it's Josie JS Thursday once again, and we are gathered to speak about random stuff. Um, and as per usual, we have a code of conduct. Um, we would like you to be nice because it's the nice thing and the right thing to do. Uh, be respectful and uh, constructive. Um, we like to work together and in that sense also like share questions and things with us and don't be spammy because like yeah spamming is not good um we like to take the opportunity to thank our sponsors um Inesis and microsoft that allow us to keep doing what we're doing um and we love it um and not only that um if you have questions that you share with us in the live stream uh on youtube there might be an opportunity for us to also show it on the screen with your name on it um so that we could um interact with you um and then the topic for today is all about javascript libraries um we are so we've talked quite a bit about this topic uh among the panel people that you see today um and we feel like in software there is quite a lot of issues that not um like one thing fits all type situations and we're going to spend the time tonight just saying that these are the kind of problems that you can have and these are the kind of tools um or libraries um that you could use to kind of solve those problems or at least um yeah, if you don't have a problem, just want to like do something, you know, you can do it with this library and this is what it does. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And the first person to be talking about their loved or uh, otherwise um, mixed feelings library or API is Jerry. Take it away. Hello. Thanks, Rudy. Uh, we missed our monthly joke. We forgot our monthly joke. We'll have to come up with one before the end. <laughs> so Jerry just had to be yeah. different, right? Because we were like, yes, we'll do our favorite JavaScript library. And Jerry says, no, I'm going to do an API. I don't, it's head slash API in the title, okay? You added that afterwards. <laughs> of course, of course. So I'm going to be talking about the Web HID API, which is... Mike said is a browser API, but first, before we get to what it actually does, let me tell you a little bit about what it's there for. So firstly, what is HID? Well, HID stands for human interface devices and a human interface device is pretty much any device that can take input from a person to the computer and provide output. So. Uh, things like keyboards, mouses, uh, game pads, uh, game controllers, all of those things. All operating systems have a HID protocol, which they implement. It's a standardized protocol. Um, and when I say operating systems, I don't just mean Windows and Mac and computer operating systems. I mean all operating systems, including all consoles. Uh, PlayStations, Nintendo, Switches, all of those things, they use the same protocol to use their input devices. And originally, the HID protocol, <coughs> excuse me, used to only support USB devices. Um, so you had to have something that was wired, plugged in by a USB. But more recently, they've introduced others uh, such as Bluetooth, more, most commonly, and other connection methods as well. So that's what an HID device is. What's problem? What is the problem with it? Well, we have a ton of different devices. We have uh, the standard ones that everybody knows and implement the same way of input and output. So you can use a mouse in the same way on any operating system. Uh, you don't have to change anything. But then we get other devices which are slightly different. They're too new or too old or too uncommon to be used on a certain operating system. And those devices implement their own standards for certain inputs and outputs. So if you take, for example, a PlayStation controller 
and a Nintendo Switch controller, the way you push the buttons on each of those is different, is implemented differently because they were implemented by different developers and therefore they only work on that console. But sometimes we want to make them work on our computers because, you know, it's fun to connect your Nintendo Switch controller and play the dinosaur game with the Nintendo Switch controller because you can do that. And if you go to the link, which is in the in the description of the video, I think, um, you can see an implementation of that that someone did. And if you have a Nintendo Switch controller, you should try it out. It's quite fun. You have to actually jump when the dinosaur jumps. <laughs> anyway, now, that's not the only problem. So there's no, no standards. Second problem is that there's very poor support for some devices. So some devices are very old. Uh, back in the day when we all used to play LAN games, we used to get those face, fancy gamepad controller things that you could program. Yeah, most games these days don't support those anymore. It would be cool if you could actually still support them because, um, you know, it, those things were pretty cool. They worked well for those the games of those days. And all of this requires a lot of hacks to get the actual controllers to work on a browser game, for example. And there's the problem of multi-platform support. So uh, sometimes things are only sep uh, operate, uh, supported on Windows, not on Mac, and then you can't use them cross-platform as well. What is the WebHID API? Well, it's a browser API, like I said earlier, which means it's supported in browsers. We'll talk about which browsers a little bit later because it's still relatively new and experimental, but it pretty much uses the HID protocol to allow you access to the device and to allow you to uh, receive inputs and provide outputs to the human interface device using JavaScript, which is the best part, right? Because we all know JavaScript and we know how to use it. <laughs> and let's talk about how it works. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? <laughs> so it is asynchronous by nature because inputs from a human interface device are generally asynchronous. You just have to listen for them and wait until the person pushes a button on the device in order to receive it. Um, there are two ways of accessing the device. That's the code that you see on the screen right now. The one is by calling request device. So as you can see, it's available on Navigator. You can check if HID is on Navigator before doing this so that you don't try to run this in a browser that doesn't support it. It just won't work anyway. Um, but the request would prompt the user, so a little pop-up will come up and prompt you to select the device you're requesting. You do have to provide some filters for that before you can access those devices. You can't just request all of the HID devices that are connected to the computer. The filters you have to provide are the vendor ID and product ID of the device. Um, there's a way to find that. It's relatively easy. And I'll share a link a little bit later to a talk I did on WebUSB where you how, how to find it. But you pretty much have to use your system settings and you can list all of the devices connected to your computer and they have the vendor ID and product ID. Vendor IDs and product IDs are standard things set by the standards, like USB and Bluetooth standards committee. Um, that you that you have to use for your product. So a vendor like, for example, Nintendo would have their own ID and all of their devices would have to use that ID. And then the product ID would be each controller would have a different product ID. Then the other way of doing it is just by calling get devices. Get devices will get 
or devices that have previously been granted access to this app. So if you've previously connected to this device, because the first time you connect to it, you say, I am allowing this website to connect to this device, uh, then get devices will be able to get that device the next time. So that's a little bit of a security thing, but we'll talk more about security later. Once you have the device, we have to open a connection to the device. We just do that by calling device.open. And then we can start listening for the input report events. Uh, the messages sent between the HID devices and the computer are called reports, input or output reports. And um, they're pretty much unsigned integer arrays with a bunch of data in them. They have actually three parts to them. They have a device ID, so you can if you have multiple devices connected, you can tell them apart. So the, if you have both like a PlayStation controller and a Nintendo controller or something, they have a report ID, which is defines which part of the device was used. So were you using the little navigation stick or the buttons or the whatever it was? And then they have a bunch of data and you can, Output that data, display it, uh, unsigned integer array. You have to do a little bit of bitwise maths to figure out what the data is saying. And then uh, you figure out how the device works based on that. Um, for output stuff, so that's input from the device into the computer. For output stuff, it's things like making the controller vibrate or changing the lights. So one of the other examples on the link that you'll see is a thing that changes your Mac's, Mac keyboard's lights. Um, it makes them blink. Uh, it's a little bit scary with the first time you try it because it's a website accessing your Mac's keyboard. But um, yeah, uh, it's it's quite cool. So that's that's the kind of output stuff you do. The thing you have to be careful of with the output things is that you start when you start accessing the output parts of the device. If you send the wrong set of data, you can <laughs> damage the firmware on the devices. So uh, then you might not be able to upgrade. So there's a library in GitHub that someone created for the Joy-Con controllers for the Nintendo Switch. And there's a big warning at the top that says, I do not take responsibility for, <laughs> for you breaking your controllers <laughs> if you use this library. <laughs> So just be careful with the output. The inputs, the inputs easier to play with. The outputs are, but can be a bit scary. But yeah. Um, so, but for what you can send to the actual things, you can find it online. It's and it's people who've actually accomplished those things by trial and error, um, and that's one of the things that for. Those of you who know me, you know that I talk about these web APIs a lot. Um, with the blue, web Bluetooth and web USB APIs, um, when I was doing it, I struggled a lot to find the kind of data that needs to be sent and received between the devices because it's really difficult to understand to understand the data and what it means. Whereas with uh, the HID API, what's really cool is you can actually connect it and then listen to the different uh, collections, reports, and things that you can send. And you can even list, <clears throat> list all of them out so that you can see what, what their IDs are, so what those device IDs and the report IDs are, so you can identify them and then find descriptions. So it's, I think it's a little bit easier to use than those other APIs because they have those options for actually listing the features that are on the device rather than you having to go and dig them out using other listeners and apps and things like that. Um, yeah, that's how. And then on that same note, how is it different to Web Bluetooth and Web USB? Because we're still connecting these devices to Web Bluetooth, to Bluetooth and to USB. You still have to connect the device 
by plugging it in or by connecting it to your operating system's Bluetooth. So it's different because actually web Bluetooth and web USB don't support HID devices for security reasons. Um, so uh, because web Bluetooth and web USB are actually a bit less secure, they have less security implementations, they don't support the HID devices because it would be an easy way for someone to create, you know, like a key logger or something like that online by uh, just connecting to your Bluetooth keyboard and logging all of your passwords that you're typing and things like that. So, yeah, there's also one other API, which is similar to this, but kind of different, and it's called the GamePad API. It's also an experimental API for now, and it also connects to different gamepads, so different controllers and things. It's slightly different to the HID API because it doesn't give you as much control. So for example, with the uh, controllers that have accelerometers, um, you can't access that in the gamepad API. You can access it in HID. So you can access the accelerometer in the controller. Stop building your browser games with whatever controller anyone connects to to it with. All right. So that was, I was speaking very fast. I feel like I was speaking very fast, but we can move on to the next slide. Cool. Now, problem with experimental APIs is they are experimental. So they haven't been approved by the Web Standards Committee. And unfortunately, they are only this API is currently only supported in Chromium-based browsers. So um, Chrome, Edge, and Opera are the only ones who support it because it's, it's a, built into Chromium as a base. Um, other operating, uh, I mean, browsers haven't specified whether they're going to support it. Safari is always iffy on these things. Firefox usually supports things that get accepted into the web standards. Um, yeah, so we'll see how that goes. But this is really, really new. I think the first proper version of it was released at the end of last year. So it's still a lot newer than most of the other ones as well. Right, and then one last thing I need to mention is security. So. I mentioned the whole keylogger thing and how you'd be skeptical about allowing um, a website to access a device. And that's the nice thing about a lot of these APIs is that firstly, they, they are always user triggered. So in order for your website to access a device, there has to be a user action that initiates the scanning for the device. So there has to be a click or something like that. And it can't just be a click from inside JavaScript. It has to be an actual interaction from the user. So they have to click a button to say, scan for devices. So that's the first line of defense. It's still not a great line of defense, but, but it's there. Uh, the second thing is it always after you select the device, asks you, are you sure you would like to give this device access to this website? Um, it's not cross, uh, cross tab, so it only works in one tab at a time. And then there are certain standard HID devices which are still protected and aren't allowed to be connected. So, um, so certain keyboards, for example, and mouse inputs and outputs and things like that would be protected and you wouldn't be able to connect to them. And that's that's it. Um, uh, yeah, so as far as the security goes, it's still not perfect, but they are actually, because it's still in the process of being built and everything, they are do have on their website, they have a thing about about security and how they're improving it in the process. Yeah. So I've got a question. I'm, I'm going to ask. Yes. So like, I just need to be sure I'm hearing this correct. 
a website can probably have a button on the page that says click this button for me to do awesome things with your with your keyboard and you're like yeah that sounds cool i'm going to click that button are you sure yes and then it breaks your whatever's connected to your your computer like is is that is that really is that really feasible is that what we're talking about that is that is what we're talking about yes <laughs> um <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's awful. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, who thought that was okay? Uh, I mean, it still hasn't been accepted to the web standards, <laughs> so that might be one of the reasons why. Uh, there, I mean, there must there must be some more subtlety to it, because surely you can't just trivially break something. No, no. So, so look, like the warning, the warning that I read about for the outputs thing was, was someone I think who was just trying to not get in trouble. Okay. So I don't think you would break it completely. Uh, so I think, I think the main thing that it said is that it might struggle with firmware updates in future. So like it won't, it won't destroy it. It's just, yeah. it just might myself slightly so like the thing slightly inconvenience so the thing I'm, I'm worried about with like the joy-con controllers is that it, connecting them to your computer like this um if you're experimenting and changing the data you're sending to them that you make it so that they can connect to your actual nintendo um yeah. Stuff like that. I think that that's ca the kind of problem you could introduce. I don't think you could actually like break it completely, like destroy your Max keyboard. You know. Okay. Question. Telling me suspicious. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry, I just interrupted you. Um, a way for you to know what kind of things it would be doing or accessing in your um, device, whatever it might be. Like the list of functions mm. to give you a clear idea. Yes, yes, yes. A, yes, label, yes. So a label that says, I am totally not a keylogger. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so, it, so it does, it, you can list all of the things that are, uh, that are connected and all of the features that that thing has. So, so like, for example, when you connect a device uh, in that code snippet where all of those different report IDs, they have like descriptions. So, so like this is the keys, this is the um, lights, this is the little uh, controller stick thing, whatever it's called. I don't even know what it's called, but yeah. Yeah, so, so you can list all of the things and uh, like all of the devices, all of their features, whether they input or output features, um, and like what what you can do to them, kind of thing. Which is also why it's a lot. I feel like it's a lot easier to figure out how to do because uh, rather than uh, compared to the web Bluetooth and web USB, because you on those you can't list things like that. You can just try stuff. Cool. If there are any questions, please feel free to um, smash them in the chat. We'll bring up the question up on screen. So just make sure you're comfortable having your your question brought up on screen before asking it. Um, and I suppose we. Thanks, Jerry. That that's terrifying and super cool, <laughs> and like both at the same time. Um, but I think let's I feel like a to... lot of the the things I speak about are like that. <laughs> I mean, no, no. I'm sensing a trend here. <laughs> yeah. Aren't you trying to hack our keyboards? See you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wait, we've got a question I... from Tomoko. Okay, I also have one after this. Go for it. Does this API require permissions from the end user in order to work like the geolocation API? I think um, the short answer is yes. yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's the short answer. So it will ask you when you when you click the request devices button, it will show you the devices that you filtered by, 
And then once you select one, it will ask you, are you sure you want to connect to this device? Cool. And then Rudy, your cool. question? Yes, I, I wanted to ask, ideally these are technologies that we, you know, put in business or in our lives to improve the way we currently do whatever we're currently doing right now. Um, and most of the examples that you have um, mentioned were like some game related, some um, like, you know, switch in the house related. I wanted to ask like where in the, like the business world would you see such an application um, or us using this to, for other clients in like the business world or other like, you know, relevant work place environment it doesn't necessarily need to be a bank sorry I've been traumatized yeah. um but <laughs> it's just like you know um other real world um examples that you can come up with for such a api so, so someone recently called me an xbox mvp and uh i got a bit offended at that um but <laughs> uh yeah so uh, this is, I mean, a lot of this is mostly, I would say, for things like building games that run in browsers uh, uh, and accessing, for now at least, and accessing the devices that um, that you would use for gaming purposes. However, I do think that there are certain HID devices that we would eventually get to a point where they're not cross-platform enough for us to be able to actually find the drivers for them. Um, I can't think of a particular example right now of an exact thing, but um, I'm sure there'll, there'll come a point where those things that we need to use still aren't supported on the new platforms and the new operating systems and we would have to implement them somehow in the browser. Yeah, there, I mean, there's lots of legacy applications that have dedicated hardware that's reliant on like an IE plugin of some kind that gets installed on the machine that um, enables the, the device. This could really be a way to, to circumvent that. So it is useful, terrifying, but useful. Now onto the important questions, important questions. Can this API configure the RGB on your keyboard? Thank you for asking exactly what was on my mind. Yes, it, it can. It can. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now it's, uh, now it's cool. Not less scary. Much cool. Uh, yeah, I haven't I haven't tested it myself to to be honest, but uh, I'm sure if it can make the lights blink on your Mac keyboard, then then it can probably configure the RGB as well. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Not scary at all. Not it's scary. fine. Totally this is fine. fine. Okay. Fine. Uh, yes, can we're done. Uh, let's let's move on to awesome. Awesome. Uh, Rudy. Okay, Thank Rudy, you, Rudy, you're up. Yes, I am going to talk about something called tipped app. Um, and uh, this concept that actually is not super foreign to everyone, especially if ever you've um, used any like code review stuff like GitLab and try to put some text and want to customize it and make it bold and make it do all those things. These things are called rich text editors that um, a lot of um, organization use to allow their customers to customize content. Um, and one of them and fairly new is called TipTap. So um, TipTap has the benefit of being um, headless, meaning that you have full control of what you can actually do with this rich text editor from how the styling is and how um, it's positioned, the way you want to do it. Um, this is an example of how like a typical um, rich text editor would look like, but it just gives you data and you can transform and do uh, with that data as you please. Uh, the second thing is that it, it is framework agnostic, meaning that you don't necessarily have to stick to React or Angular. It comes with Vue.js out of the box and vanilla JavaScript. So you can just like see where you land from that, uh, but you can then make it work for other um, frameworks as well. So it's, uh, yeah, um, kind of cool 
in that sense. Um, yeah, so let's go on to the next page so that we can talk about how you can actually start using it. Um, so this is just a code example to um, show you how you can start integrating um, TipTap into uh, your um, project. And the first thing is that you need TipTap um, core, um, which is where the editor is. And the editor is pretty much um, the part where you type in stuff and you know um, where the content actually goes. And then it comes with the starter kit out of the block, uh, out of the box. So the version that you see here is called TipTap 2. TipTap 1 used to not have the starter kit. So if ever you needed things like bold, italic, um, underline, and things like that, you would have to literally configure or not like not literally configure, but call those in uh, yourself because um, I think the idea is that they're trying to keep it as like user defined as possible. So if you don't want text to ever be bold, we don't want to shove that down your throat kind of situation. But the starter kit then gives you that out of the box. So as soon as you add that, then you already like miraculously have um, an editor that you can modify and like put good stuff in. And like GitLab actually uses this, um, which is also a surprise and a good find uh, because I work a lot with GitLab and okay, I am going to reserve my comments, but um, it is um, it is very widely used in the wild um, outside of the fact that it's actually in beta, it's open source, and they've got really, really cool developers behind it trying to use it and make it really great. And it has cool documentation. I must say uh, the version two, tip tap two, is so much better in documentation than the previous one. So really, it's really quick to, quick to start with this library. And I really like how it's like easy to customize. So um, my pros and cons for this uh, library are these. So first, UI customization, right? So what I've been talking about is that you can actually do whatever you want to do with this um, uh, AP, oh, like um, library, I mean, and you can like style it the way you want to do it. And I feel like that kind of freedom when it comes to these kind of things, because like you don't want to be highlighting content and it's not behaving like all the other content in all the other places that you expect it to. So it's very important to have that consistent user interface. You can also allow a uh, keyboard shortcut. So again, when you're trying to type something in your content, you want to be able to still do what you would do in Word also in like whatever text, uh, rich text editor you, you add in your application. It has mobile support. And also, which is amazing, is that you can import and export HTML and uh, JSON. So you are not really um, typed into um, only working with HTML like most other rich text editors, but you can actually work with the JSON structure, which makes life a little bit easy because there's quite a lot of information that's coming at you. And ideally, you want to be able to know that, OK, I can get this kind of schema to do these kind of things and all of that. Um, personal experience, uh, we do quite a bit of this um, content manipulation type behavior in the current organization that I'm in. And basically, after that content, we need to save that content somewhere. Um, and it's really hard to make sure that whenever that content is read back again, it actually is formatted nicely into the page. Um, you get uh, situations where like things that were in line when you were editing your, co your content is suddenly split into multiple lines when you are in the um, uh, like whatever way that information is displayed. So handling that kind of um, information with care is really important because what the user see is what they expect to get at the end of the, the thing. And this is pretty much what um, rich text editing is all about. Again, the cons of this is that it's in beta phase. Um, and, we, and a lot of people are already using it, meaning that they have a, a really like huge confidence in um, allowing it to be part of like their money making organizations. Um, so I don't necessarily would name it as a con. I really struggle to also find it a, a con for tip tattoo. Um, but another thing is that it's based on something called Prismera. Prismera is also like somewhat a rich text editor, but is really, really, really um, like in detail. And you might, it has a really like, like a really high learning curve for you to start actually working 
in it and like to, to try to abstract that a little bit, but you can't avoid having to go as deep as to Prose Mirror to do some of the like, customized stuff because like you can have extension on how you add images into the text. If you want those images to be dragged and dropped and deleted, you can add those extension to um, the rich text editing. But sometimes you have to go really deep within Prose Mirror to actually get these features working. And I feel like it's a slight of a miss from a tip tap perspective. And that's why it's a con. Anyway, um, yeah, so this is TipTap and Rich Text Editing and the library I'm working with as of lately. So. That's pretty cool. Um, mm. I'll encourage everyone to please ask your questions because I'm sure you have some. I think uh, a good rich text editor is always like you're not going to use it for every project, but you are going to use one at some point in time. And it's a really difficult problem to man to to reinvent yourself actually and it, there's no value in doing it um so and i only have one question myself and i hate myself for being the one to ask this but i have to is that okay. like if you had a react front end and you wanted to use tip tap to right mm -hmm. how would you how would you use it well what does that interface look like is it is there just a hook that feeds into another component or? I think you would have to, um, so based on the code snippet that I shared, um, creating it as a, a separate component that you then use in your application kind of creates that separation. Um, I've never actually tried to uh, work with it on a React application, but I think that you could just like import the editor, get uh, the same starter kit, and then start um, mapping uh, the functions that are there. Yeah, mm -hmm. please go there. Yeah, so you see, um, I, it's, so it's such a shame that it doesn't have line numbers, um, but instantiating that editor like that, and then, um, and editor does give you content. So that thing is literally going okay. to put hello world in a paragraph, and then you can start in the HTML, start adding buttons. Um, and I have no uh, screenshot for this as well, but the you would have like a button tag, and then that button you can then define a bold function, and then, then it will be bold. So you can highlight the content that you see there, and then click on that button and it will be bold. So it would be probably easier with the screenshot but yeah go and, for it and then when the user does something i'm assuming that there's a callback of some kind or you can just read the content off of the editor at any point in time does that make sense yes to an extent i think there is in the editor uh functions like events and views so okay. that whenever a user actually puts information you can then read those from that it has a state it has a schema okay. it has all these things and that that state you it like keeps on inputting information that it's probably receiving into the front end and then you can manipulate that kind of information that's as i think that was how it would work um but yeah okay Awesome. It, it's pretty cool. Um, I think it's cool too. Time. Yeah. Um, I, I also think that it is um, not lightweight in terms of like megabytes and all of that, but it's like um, it doesn't require a lot of learning compared to like, let's say, Prose Mirror, for example. It's mm. almost straightforward. If and, <laughs> and I'm biased to this because I have been using it for a bit, for some time, you know, not a long enough time for me to know uh, in depth knowledge about it, but like um, enough to to know that when I wanted to learn it, it was kind of like okay, I get that. It's e I get that. You know, I didn't have to work hard to to get everything started. Um, it could have been worse, uh, based on how Prisma is, uh, which is the library that it's built on top of. So yeah. Cool. I have All a right. quick question. Yeah. I have a quick question. So this is tip tap two. Um, is just that tip tap two. Um, tip, tap, tip, tap, tip tap tip tap one. Uh, mm. Is it same thing? Similar. Do you have to let like, go through a long process to upgrade it if you have been using the first one? Um, do you need to know That's, the first one before you can use the second one? That is a really great question, Jerry, because yes, that's what we're currently doing in my firm, trying to upgrade to TipTap2. Uh, from six up one, and there is there are a lot of um, major changes. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> so um, tip tip one, you used to have to uh, specifically um, specify editor content within your HTML so that it knows that this is where the content goes. While now all you have to do is pretty much create that new instance and then things automatic, automatically work, right? Um, we have created quite a few extensions um, at, at the company because we are trying to do cool things with the content that we are trying to customize. And that is a pain now because a lot of things have changed. One of them is that tip tip one was um, class-based uh, and now we are functional component-based in tip tip too so all of that needs to change meaning that the way we now actually create the entire thing has to change we have new functions we have new event handlers that actually bring a lot of benefit because they are um you know i'd say like easy to integrate um the documentation on it is better so um yeah it has been a headache and a half to try to keep that the other thing that was a gotcha was that both of them can't exist, meaning that we have a gigantic uh, merge request that's sitting somewhere that is waiting the golden moment to be merged to the master because um, we can't actually work on them um, side by side, uh, side by side, so that we can slowly start moving our integrations. So it's quite a, a migration and, and a, an update or upgrade at the moment. That legit gives me anxiety. I'm just saying. Like the, the words, it, it we have a change. big merge request. It's just, <laughs> no. It's it's going to be massive. And it's like <laughs> at the core of some of the things that we do. But, you know, we are great at doing this. We've been doing it for a long time. We've got this. But yeah, um, <laughs> it's, 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 um, it has been quite a challenge to move things across because they have really improved. Um, so it's a really good step forward. Um, for the library. So, so if you're cool. starting, if you're starting, you should start at two. Ignore one. If you're starting, yeah, definitely start at two. And you would thank okay. yourself for doing that as well. <laughs> awesome. It's cool. I'm just cognizant of time. So I think um, if we move on to the next library, um, I'm going to take very little time so we can get on to Ryan's. Uh, I'm, I'm staying on brand for those that know me. I like making things go fast. Um, so, so I thought I would talk about my favorite library, which is something that I use in production on a big site. I use every single day. It is, it is the, the first tool that I reach for in the toolbox at the moment. So like, I promise you, I, I, I love this. I have spent a lot of time in this library and it's awesome. Now, anybody that's tried to do any kind of performance stuff would have run a Lighthouse report or something at some point in time. And then maybe learn some stuff from the Lighthouse report, which is, is lab data or a synthetic test. So it's faking a user interaction loading the page, right? So um, you'd get some stuff from it. You'd get some stuff to optimize for, and you'd be like, okay, cool. I think I understand how my page is, is, is working. And then you go and take a look at something like either the Chrome UX report or you go take a look at PageSpeed Insights because Google tells you that um, you need to look at real user data, so field data, not lab data, and actual results as opposed to synthetic tests, um, which can only do so much. Um, and then you look at that and you're like, but but my CLS score is so awful in live, or my th this data looks terrible, and Google thinks that my performance is awful, but my Lighthouse report looks okay. Like it's I don't I don't know I can't marry these two worlds together. So so may maybe that's you, and then maybe you're like, okay, cool. Well, what real user monitoring stuff is there? And you go take a look at either Speed Curve Lux or New Relic, or I think. I think Fastly has one, I think Akamai has one, and you look at the exorbitant, insane pricing, and you look at your site, whatever it may be, or your product owner who's trying to save as much money as possible, and you think to yourself, well, I guess we're just not going to get real user metrics, right? And so many people are in that world, so many people. Even if you do use one of the big name brand um, uh, uh, web vitals or real user metric gathering things it really just shackles you into understanding things from their perspective so like you have to trust that they're measuring things correctly right now i have trust issues big trust issues which is part the reason why i love web vitals js 
So this was released by Google um, by the, the performance team. It's, it's tiny, absolutely tiny, minuscule, less than a kilobyte worth of code. Um, and it's designed to be modular, so you can plug into it. Now, the crucial part is that this is calculating all of those real user metrics stuff the same way that Google calculates it when they measure it and report it to Crux. So it's them saying, this is how we calculate layout shift. This is the latest and greatest in the standard for it, or first input delay, or whatever the case may be, um, which, which is awesome because they're literally defining what these metrics mean. They're measuring people against those metrics. Um, so it's great to use a library that you know exposes them directly. Now, with that accuracy, not all browsers are Chrome, and this is Google, and Google designs the stuff primarily for Chrome. So um, not all of those metrics are necessarily, or the things that are required for those metrics are available in other browsers. Um, and this, sorry, dogs. Uh, this library, <laughs> this library also includes a whole bunch of polyfills for particular problematic fields, such as first input delay, so that you can include the polyfill and get really accurate results, like really, really accurate results, even in browsers that don't completely support them. Now, there's still some metrics that, that can't be supported because the browsers don't expose that stuff, but um, but they do a really, really good job. Now, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show some code, and I do have line numbers, Rudy. So there's that. I may not be as slick Shade. as everybody else, but I've got line numbers. Shade. Wow. So um, the, the Web Vitals library, you can either uh, import it from Unpackage, or you can import it as an NPM module and build it yourself. Um, and like I've just shown CLS, FID, and LCP here, but there's also um, FCP and TTFB, and um, they also like test the, the new stuff that's coming through that might be included in like later on. There's a ball behind me, and the dogs are fighting over the ball. Okay, sorry. Um, anyway, okay. anyway. So it's just a case of importing those functions from the library. And then once you call them, it takes in a, a, a almost a callback function, right? And that callback function has um, an object on it. And that object has a bunch of data. So it tells you like what type of event, or vital event is coming through, what the value is, what entries constitute that, and a whole bunch of, of, of other data, like really, really detailed stuff. Um, I'll give a use case of like a real world use case that um, uh, that we do, um, and then you can you can do stuff like log them out. You can save it. You can aggregate them, um, and crucially, <laughs> crucially, you can um, do things like use your analytics because you, you probably have signed up for some kind of analytics, even if it's Google Analytics, right? So you can use Google Analytics, which you can get virtually for free. Um, and then just take all of this data and ship it to wherever your business users are making the decisions, right? So a product cares about the SEO, or the SEO impact, or which pages are more expensive or valuable. Um, or click through or conversion rate, put performance data next to it, right? And have people look at like the RAMs and sense of it alongside performance data and correlate those two trends together. That's the quickest, easiest way to convince your business that performance is a feature, by the way, and it's easy. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not joking. I copied and pasted this code from the GitHub library. Uh, it's really cool. Um, then uh, this can go really, really in depth. You can even do stuff like for layout shift, for example, sake. You get every single element that has shifted, so you can try and figure out well which element on this page is contributing the most to the cumulative layout shift on the page and stuff like that. Um, it's small, it's lightweight, it's fast, and you can get access to lots of real user data that you can store virtually for free and really get a handle on what your users are experiencing from a performance perspective. And this is the best way to actually make your site faster um, or this kind of data using this data um, over you know, synthetic tools. I'm going to mute while I wait for questions, just in case the fight picks up again. Awesome.
Um, I, I, I do have two questions. The other one is really a follow up on this one. The other one is really like completely, well, different, but uh, what I learned about um, this library as I was looking into it earlier today. Um, how is the support for iframes uh, at the moment? What do you mean the support for iframes? So I learned that there's a limitation in actually being able to get um, statistics or the web vitals, if ever maybe you have an iframe in your page, that it doesn't necessarily actually would look into um, like how that performs in your page at the moment using WebJS vitals. No, I think that's a, I think the reason why is because your JavaScript cannot access across the domain into the iframe if that makes sense you can't like it's a, it's a separate separate url it's a separate origin essentially um the okay. two get sandboxed from one another so like no javascript code is ever going to be able to give you that you would need browser level instrumentation to be able to pick up those values um so like a plugin might be able to but i um, i don't know if it would um, or you'd have to script the browser directly externally okay but a good question i see you trying to catch me up no i'm not trying to catch you up <laughs> i just like i i read through the get um her page that you shared um and i then saw that at the uh so that you know that i did research um yeah limitation thanks rudy right? I, I feel <laughs> like thank you <laughs> I do. Like, I appreciate like it. I... That's it. Okay, fair enough. Um, the but, other thing that I wanted to ask. Okay, go for it. Yeah. No, 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 no. Ask. Um, is the 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 information? So I've had some experience with you when it comes to performance and all of those things. But sometimes I know that the device that the user is using, uh, their internet speed obviously uh, contributes to some of these measurements. Um, and I was wondering if ever this, uh, if you have web vitals, is there some kind of information that you're also getting at the fact that, okay, this part of your page was slow because this user was using um, an Opera Mini in like, I don't know, some phone that doesn't supposed to be working in 2021 type thing. You know, like what kind of information to that extent? That's, that's a wonderful question. And like, so um, webvitals.js doesn't do that. But you can use the performance observer and you can progressively enhance to see, well, does the performance observer exist? Does the, the browser at least new enough to give me this kind of information? And then you can ask for network connection speed information from the browser agent. And then when you send the Google Analytics stuff, you can send that with as well. And you can say, well, here's some additional network information that I've gotten because the browser has, or has downloaded the stuff over this connection. And I've got some sort of information as to it's not it's not a hell of a lot like it's not fingerprint level stuff because that's the other part right you don't want to be able to instrument and fingerprint individual human beings but you can get enough to say oh this person was on a bad connection and this experience this experience was tied to this bad connection very useful Perfect. and like like it's, it's a Lego block right and it fits into so many things because you can you can do this on a you know on a, a request idle callback so it doesn't impact your page load you can do this on demand when um you can a b test this stuff and um, pass through additional data and pick anyway it's just javascript and it's lovely so i have a quick question too um what uh, you were talking about like using this kind of thing for very large websites so you can get real user data because you have so many different users. But would something like this be useful even just like as you're starting out, like just to, to get on top of the performance issues before you even get to that point where you have millions of users? A hundred percent, completely. Um, and like the, the crucial part here is that the data that you get from this is the people that are actually using your service. If you've got a, a beefy desktop or a powerful MacBook Pro that you're busy testing your site on, and Lighthouse looks good, it's got good results. Um, I don't know why people are complaining that things are slow. That doesn't mean that your site isn't slow, right? Um, 
So even if you if even if you've only got a couple hundred users, this is a great way of keeping track of those couple hundred users. Um, and you know, just improving your performance of your site. Cool. Cool. And then so yeah. It it just stores like the performance data, right? You were saying there's no like fingerprinting, no none of that information in this. So it's not like an issue as far as privacy and things like that are concerned. Well well it doesn't store anything, right? It just calculates the values incredibly oh, yes, correctly in a very easy way. You can store that stuff wherever you want and no, it doesn't do any anything that's fingerprint oriented it's very privacy conscious so like you wouldn't have to for example list it in your list of things things we know about you privacy statement thing nope cool okay awesome cool well i hope everybody goes and uses web puts web vitals on their page it's like 10 lines of code do it just do it but now Ryan. So, has this ever happened to you? Sorry, no, let's let's put the infomercial stuff aside. So, the library I'm going to be talking to you about today helps us with validation. So, a lot of the time what will have happened is you've written a function and you've made certain assumptions about what uh, what information is actually being passed in. Uh, and what the types are of those. For those of you who are using TypeScript and think you're safe, I've got some bad news. Uh, TypeScript doesn't actually help with runtime types. So if that data is, being, is coming in from an input box or from another API, you do still need to validate it and guard against that. So first, what I'm going to do is to just show you how we might do this with standard vanilla JavaScript. So I've got a function over here. And uh, if you hate my theme, then sorry about that. Uh, if you love it and you want to get uh, get it set up, I've got a GitHub gist that I'll put in the show notes a bit later. Um, but yeah, back to what we're doing. So we've got a function over there, takes in a value that could potentially be a number, and we want to check and make sure. In this particular instance, it is only valid if the number is exactly five. Uh, so this is a bit of a contrived example, and I could have just checked for is it strictly equal to five right at the start, but I'm going to just show you some of the things that we might check. Uh, and in this particular instance, I want to throw an error as soon as it's invalid. So it's not like I'm going to do some type of error recovery. Uh, uh, and also, by the way, while we're talking about errors, uh, one of the upcoming shows is going to have uh, a lot of information on how to handle errors. So look out for that if you're if you're uh, into using errors, which you should be. Don't throw strings, please. Um, Cool. So for example, we check the type to make sure that it's a primitive specifically of type number. Uh, we use the modulus function to check if it's odd or even. Uh, we use the built-in number.is integer. A and you can see that this code, you know, if you were going to do some complex logic in this function, you've taken up a whole bunch of lines just doing some validation on what's actually being passed in. And as we go to the next slide, what we'll see is uh, using uh, cross uh, so the cross env check types library so uh, to to make this a little bit cleaner well actually a lot cleaner so let's go to the next slide do, do, do. so here you can see uh, what the library has built in so I've taken the exact same code it's the same logic I've just done it using the library so you'll see here we use check types dot assert and what that does is it tells the library that if it fails the uh, check, it must throw an error. And if you look at line 14, you'll see I've, I'm also able to provide a custom error message if I'm not happy with the error message that the library has 
built in and I can inject all sorts of values in there using templated strings, which I love. And the nice thing is if you don't want to throw an error, say for example, you're going to use some sort of logic. So if this thing wasn't a number, uh, maybe it was a string. Let me try and parse it to a number. Uh, you, can, you, you can just take out the dot assert. So it uses a fluent API. Uh, so you can take that bit out and you can wrap it in an if statement and you can try some extra logic over there. In this particular instance, I've just included um, the some of the some of the methods we can use on the number type specifically. But as I'll show you in a little bit, the library has a lot of different uh, uh, primitives and objects supported, so it's very uh, useful. One of the slight drawbacks is it's going to add 7.2 k's to your bu your bundle size unmin uh, unminified. Gzip, that goes down to 2.6K, so it's still very fairly small. Uh, and you know I, I'm a big fan of start from a place where your code is as maintainable as possible, and from that position, you can get to performance if you need it. And in this particular instance, I think that the trade-off of having your code a lot more readable is well worth the effort of having 7.2 Ks in your in your bundle size if if you're not minifying. Mike's gonna have some words to say about that. We'll we'll have a fight about that a little bit later. All right. Um so yeah, there's some really useful things like between, you can check that a number's greater than, positive, integer, even odd. Uh, there's a bunch that I didn't include here, but uh, if you go to the docs, which are linked uh list uh the link to there at the bottom of the slides on NPM, you can read through that. All right, so let's go to the next slide and I will take you through what else is included. This is again, not comprehensive. I just wanted to highlight it a few things. Oftentimes we wanna check if something's null specifically or undefined specifically, rather than checking, is it just falsy? Uh, and there's also a shorthand for, a, for if it is null or undefined and that's called assigned. Uh, and that's useful so that you don't have to include lodash for argument's sake for the is null check if you aren't, if you already have this in, uh, in your, in your uh, package. There's some really nice string assertions that you can use. For example, empty string, non-empty string, does it contains, uh, is this other string uh, in, and also match if you want to use regexes. So that's fairly useful, and I've, I've used that quite a bunch to check for a little bit more complicated bits and pieces. Uh, the Boolean one's fairly simple. It's either a Boolean or not. Uh, function checks if it's a function or not, and it also has does this thing throw, uh, which is quite uh, quite interesting. So you can um, check uh, check for that if you need to. Uh, the object keyword, so that uh, that basically you know you want to see is this object empty? So is it just like no keys have been assigned? Uh, is it a non-empty object? Is it thenable, i.e. is it a promise uh, or following the particular promise practice? Uh, you can use instance that basically uses the type of, uh, sorry, instance of under the hood. Uh, contains is useful to check if uh, it contains a specific value on any of the keys. I haven't had a chance yet to check if that walks the whole object tree. I suspect it's only the top level. Uh, and then obviously contains key. Uh, that'll check if your object has that specific key. And then like, which is basically doing duck typing to see if two objects are duck equivalent. Uh, there is the array method. So you can use to check for an empty array uh, or if something's array-like. So for those of you who've ever done some dodgy stuff where you're using the arguments keyword, you'll notice that it's kind of an array, but it actually isn't an array. It's array-like. Uh, there's also iterable on that. And then the uh, date keyword uh, helper is just to, uh, a thin wrapper around um, is date for, for dates. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So I just wanted to point out a note on validating very complicated objects. So if you've got all sorts of deep nested um, properties on your object and you want to check very specific rules, 
this is often used when you are building an API and you want to validate what the user has posted or put through to your API. And if you find that you're doing this, um, then check types is not the appropriate library for that. And I would highly recommend you check out uh, JSON schema. And in particular, the AJV library is one of the best that I've used for using JSON schema. So it's an actual open format. For those of you crazy kids like me who use MongoDB, you'll probably already be fairly familiar with JSON schema. It's how we do uh, semi-structured data uh, in, J in Mongo. And, and that allows us to write fairly complicated business rules uh, around how the data should actually be structured and under what conditions is it actually valid. You can use JSON schema also to uh, do default values and type coercion. So for example, if somebody posts through a string, you can use the type coercion to actually get it into a number if it is valid. And there's a very basic example of a schema that would do exactly what we did with our vanilla JavaScript, as well as with the check types library. OK, I think that was my last slide. Or am I lying? Nope. You are not my lying. That was your last, last slide. <laughs> I had a bit of a panic there. I was like, hmm, did I have more slides? Oh, no. What oh, else I think did I, I, I think I covered it. Cool. So, so have we got any questions? I'm going to try and summon the, the spirit of Karen and say, well, it's less a, it's less a question and more a comment. Uh, and I, I really like it. I like, I think it's a good library. I think it's really, really elegant. I like the fluent API and, um, like you, to be clear, and I think we can agree on this. You don't include something like check types if you're going to validate one field, right? No, no, please. This is one of those things. If like your whole team is going to use it. <laughs> When you know you have a problem, you're like, okay, cool. We need this stuff under control. Check types is a great yes. solution. And then I think, I don't know. I think I could justify seven kilobytes of my my first page load budget or bundle size to mm -hmm. to making sure that validation doesn't suck. Yeah, you know, in in my particular context, uh, being more of a backend JavaScript developer, bundle size is a lot less of a concern. So for me, it's almost a default include. Uh, and then I, I tend to use sprinkle it everywhere, like little glitter everywhere. And that's, it makes me happy. <laughs> like my VS Code theme. <laughs> which, which is awesome. Mind bending, but <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's really cool. Does anyone else have any questions? I do. Um, no. And do we have one from the audience? No, not yet. Um, Okay, cool. Um, so I'm also in favor of this uh, library. I, I, I think I like it. And uh, building on to the idea that you won't be using this for uh, just one field, right? Um, got me thinking that um, the idea of dynamic typing, right, is that when there's likely not information that you have within um, your application. It's things that are coming out from the outside. So APIs to information that you get on the database and all of those things. The last thing that you mentioned in the slides that you have was a JSON schema, which would likely be a place to be able to make sure that you build your types coming into your application the way you would want them and therefore maybe not use check type that much but my assumptions are wrong so how because you won't necessarily just use the json schema because your json mm. is really super complex but you can also actually use this to have some confidence at the types that are coming into your application from these external um things so at what point do you manage the having to control the information before it gets to your application as opposed to doing type checking with your um in inside your application on like everything that you want to you want to um, calculate or work with does it make sense does my question make sense yeah no, that's a great question so generally the way that i do it it might not be right but anything that comes into my application whether it was uh from an api call or you know even if i retrieved it from mongo because i'm not necessarily sure which version of the document schema it was because you know over time you have older documents that had a schema and then it's evolved over time so i, I tend to validate them against the schema uh, adjacent schema and then 
where I tend to use check types a lot is if I am writing functions that do bits and pieces of business logic and I want to make sure that the value that I'm passing in is actually a string or a number, that sort of thing. I, I tend to write some unit tests around that to make sure that they they fail correctly with a readable error message as opposed to, uh, you know, split does not exist on number or, you know, uh, so I find that quite useful in debugging later on. Uh, so it's it's kind of, for me, check types is like a little god. Uh, the interesting thing is if you are taking in user input and then that's passed through a JSON schema and then you're going to pass it to a function along with, let's say, one or two other primitives, I'll basically at that point, I'll assume that the the data coming in is already valid because it's run through a validator. And I'll add the two check types for the two primitives. And that'll give me a level of confidence that I that I it's not going to give me too many weird runtime errors. Well, I mean it's all runtime errors, but they won't be weird errors, is what I meant. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Sorry, and another thing that can also help you here is if you, so the way I like to use TypeScript, and this is going to come up a little bit later, is I write a TypeScript file with my type definitions, but then I don't like to transpile my my code or compile it. So I use js.comments and I import those types and I just use it to annotate my functions and objects so that I can get better um, dev time error detection uh, without the drawback of the build time or the compilation step. And you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll have a debate on this at some point and I'll get called insane, but it works for me and my team. So, yeah. I feel like you need you to write it down on Slack exactly what you're doing. <laughs> so that I can like, remember it like, later on for I, a later I, I'm going to I'm gonna replay this part of the video just because I... Thank you so I, much. I, I understood the individual words, but like I, I don't... I don't understand what the hell is going oh, on. <laughs> no, so, okay, so, so you create types. Let's let, wait. Let's put a let's put a pen in it because I'm we'll put a pen that's that. going to come in. So like next month um, is going to be about error handling and errors in JavaScript, right? And the month after that is going to be about TypeScript. We're still working All on right. the title. I'm I'm in favor of how to make TypeScript not suck, but um, <laughs> we're going to talk about TypeScript. We'll, we'll talk about it. So let's let's put a pin in that one. Um, yeah, don't don't overpromise. We don't know if no. we can make it not suck. <laughs> oh, shame. Shots fired. Sorry. There are some real questions. So before we go into the questions, if you're using TypeScript, it makes your code better. If it makes you happy, like Ryan's insanely purple bright scheme, live your best life. Okay. You go. You do cool. you. You do you. But, but after, having said that, we do have some questions still. So starting okay, off great. with, does it affect any performance in your code base? I'm assuming this is not question. just bundle side, but like processing. Actual runtime performance. Mm. Yeah, what no, that, that's a... Bundle size is actual performance. <laughs> not on the server. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Mute yeah, so... <laughs> So yeah, um, there's almost no noticeable performance. You know, we've we've run uh, quite a bit of uh, tests at the moment on what we're doing uh, with uh, with workers and stuff on AWS, and um, you know, we we profiled it before and after, and it was is very unnoticeable. I think uh, I haven't looked at the source code, but I suspect what's happening under the hood is it's just convenience methods to like number dot is integer, so it that which explains why it's almost zero performance impact. And performance, or oh, sorry, after performance updates and security. Uh, so the library is pretty much feature complete. It really hasn't been updated. I think the last update, if I'm not mistaken, was like two years ago. Um, but uh, I haven't noticed any vulnerabilities. Let me see if it's open here. Yeah, where do you see vulnerabilities on NPM? But uh, NPM audit. <laughs> I'm gonna have I don't to know type where it is on the web page. Uh, 
Yeah, I thought it would might might just be displayed on the web page somewhere, but I'll probably have to run an npm audit. Uh, but we've got very strict SOC two compliance issue uh, uh, compliance regulations that we have to uh, conform to, and it has gone through our SOC two compliance. For those of you who so don't know what SOC two is, hope hope you never have to know. Moving along swiftly, here's a really good question in terms of, is this similar to Yup and Joy? If it is, what makes it better or different? Yeah, it's it's quite similar. I've used Joy before. Um, so, I think Joy is probably a lot more popular, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's, it's also got like a little bit more of a fancier uh, interface for validating objects. Uh, yep, I haven't actually used, but I've seen it. I think it's popular in next, not next year's, one of the, the new frameworks, but um, I don't know enough to comment about Yup. Um, but I think Joy is a little bit more actively uh, used, so you're more likely to come across that. I, I actually used Yup recently. Um, in Svelte, maybe that's the one you're thinking of. Um, yes, but anyway, that's the one. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, I found yeah pretty cool. I'm I'm not sure. Maybe Ryan, you can say whether the check types has similar things, but uh, yep has like these kinds of things like you mentioned. But it also has things where you can compare, um, for example, like regex to the input you've put in and stuff like that. Uh, that's that's one of the features I used. Right. Sorry, yes, that was. Sorry, yeah, I was saying um, with with check types, you can do regex comparisons on strings. Is that what you mean, or yeah, is yeah, it yeah, like yeah. More so like yeah. patterns and stuff, yeah, yeah, yes, and, exactly. and mins and maxes and those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. so it's it is kind of similar, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah, but I've only ever used Yup in like a front end context. I've never actually used it in a uh, back end API kind of validation. Yeah, so I mean, when picking a library, there's, you know, the only metric that matters is numbers of weekly downloads, right? So by that metric, uh, check types being older, <laughs> please do not follow that advice. No. That is uh, sarcasm. That's bad advice. So, that is bad advice. Like, check types is older. It's been around for a lot longer, um, but I think that it's it's fairly stable in the number of downloads. And like, I'm looking at the Joy one now. That was last published 25 days. The curve is going up. It's on 3.8, so it's almost caught. Uh, check types, so very healthy ecosystem. Looking at Yup. Uh, last updated six months ago, and it's got about two million downloads. So you know, take those stats with a pinch of salt. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. So I, I'm. I don't think Joy plays in the same space as Check Types, right? Because Check Types is very much about the primitives that you're passing around. I think yeah. Joy is far closer to JSON schema mm. because you're trying to create like really fine grained validation against objects that are schematic so to speak and that's the context back in from a back-end perspective that i've used joy right validate this entire json structure that's coming in and is it is it legit or not um yeah and i think so like less less check types far more json schema which is what you suggested yeah and and well, the, the other nice thing about check types is also that it's a uh, zero dependencies so just standalone little library no not, not, i love it uh, i'm installing it now things <laughs> well, one of the things that on that same note for, for like, yep, the things I've used it for is also slightly different. It's more about displaying, you know, UI validation errors, uh, customizing your error messages based on what the error is, things like that, more than just checking a type in your code because you don't want to check truthy or falsy because it sometimes burns you. <laughs> yes, it definitely can. I think we've all been there. Yes. 
Okay, so I think we're we're out of questions. That was super cool. There were four very cool libraries, three very cool libraries, and one interesting, terrifying API. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that that was really really awesome. So thanks for everybody that stuck around and for for listening to us ramble on. Um, we appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comments after this and we'll listen to it. Otherwise, we'll see you next month where we talk about error handling. And uh, it'll be interesting to see different people's perspectives. So thanks a lot, folks, and yeah. um, take care. Cheers.